Welcome to Travel Fuels Life, the show where we share stories, tips, and inspiration to help you live a travel lifestyle. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. It is TBEX week. And TBEX, for those of you that don't know, is a travel conference. And I am headed out to Montana to not only reconnect with some of our guests that we've had on the show in the past, but to meet some new guests that will be coming on the show sometime over the next year. So good stuff, more travelers, more travel knowledge, more travel hacks, all the stuff that we need to be able to live this travel lifestyle. So definitely looking forward to that and what is coming up in the near future. Meanwhile, I am just getting back from bourbon trip number two. And on this trip, I was doing a lot more collecting of information for a book I'm working on. Uh Oh, interesting information there. More details to come. But on the way back, I had a chance to stop off in Clinton, Tennessee, and meet with Clayton Hensley. Clayton goes by the name Knox Road Tripper on Twitter, and we have chatted back and forth a few times. And so I thought, well, it'd be nice to go talk with him and meet him face to face. Because his spin is actually more on family travel and localized traveling. And we get so into talking about these world trips that sometimes we forget to kind of focus in our own backyard. So we're going to talk about road trips. We're going to talk about East Tennessee, where he lives, some of the stuff that you can do around there, a bit about family travel as well. And we might even discover a place that has some characteristics of Area 51, Uh, aliens maybe? No, 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 no aliens. But it is a highly secretive area, and we will talk about that coming up on the show today. So we met at a local restaurant there in Clinton, and they were doing some business, so I think we were both trying to be a little bit courteous and quiet, so we're not too boisterous throughout this conversation. But there's also moments where you'll hear some background noise with customers coming in and that sort of stuff. So it, it all worked out in the end, I think. So uh, so let's head on out to East Tennessee, to the town of Clinton. This is Clayton's hometown. And check out my conversation with him, Knox Road Tripper, here on Travel Fuels Life. All right, Clayton, well, welcome to the show. Good to be here. And uh, actually, good to have you here in East Tennessee. So, absolutely, I haven't done as much traveling here as I probably should. It's not that far from nope. where I grew up in Asheville, and so here we are. We're not in the great state of Franklin, are we? No, you're gonna go a little bit further east, but I actually am from the great state of Franklin. Are so, you? Yes, you, you and Davy Crockett, yes, same county, <laughs> really, same county. Okay, yep. is that Green? Green County, Green County, okay. okay. Andrew Johnson. Ja- Johnson was also from there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And named after General Nathaniel Green, which is why Greenville has the extra E in it. Ah, okay. My favorite Revolutionary War. I figured that. So, so all, all the traveling people are going, oh, no, they're not going to be talking <laughs> about history this whole episode. We, we do have that in common, though. Yes. I think we both yes. en- enjoy history. So I wanted to start off, actually, by talking a little bit about uh, road tripping because I haven't really had anybody on the show yet who's really more localized and tends to do the shorter yes. road trips. So I thought I'd kind of get a feel for how you do road trips versus how I do road trips. Well, but. most of our road trips have always included, I, I, ha, you know, I have a wife and two kids, so mm-hmm. a lot of it's been family oriented. Uh, A lot of the places that we've traveled, because people say, well, why don't you just fly there? It's like, mainly because there are no airports near where we're going. So, and and also being where I am now, we have an incredible amount of stuff that's just within three or four hours of here. So a Mm. lot of times you can just do it in a day or just go do a short weekend, long weekend. There's plenty to see, so. So when you're talking about one of those places that you'd like to go to that you can't fly to, what would an example be? Uh, the Iowa Missouri trip is definitely one of the ones yes you can fly but uh, my wife's family is uh, her mother's side of the family is from Unionville Missouri which is about four and a half hours from St. Louis and about three hours from Des Moines Mm -hmm. and about three and a half hours from Kansas City okay so by the time you do all your trip preparations try to get to one of those larger airports and everything 
we figured out you would have taken about the time it would take to drive there. So, nice. so, <laughs> so how do you do your uh, planning? Do you are you a planner, or do you just go and kind of grab sites uh, I'm, along the I'm, way? I'm very much a planner. Uh, you know, I look at, at look at the routes that we're going to take, see what we might be able to see along the way. Uh, of course. I'm very distracted sometimes by road signs to things that sound interesting that I didn't see were coming up. <laughs> so we might venture off and do some of those those as well. But uh, um, if it's a longer trip, you know, we'll we'll figure out where we're going to be staying if we're going to stay overnight. Usually, if it's going to be a the trip to Missouri, or if it's going to be 12 or 13 hours, we'll usually break it up mm -hmm. into two days. Uh, we do take a trip to New Orleans every year. Uh, kind of have family there that we stay with. Uh, we go for Mardi Gras. Okay. Um, so, so describe that because uh, I was actually looking at your blog about how a lot of people don't consider New Orleans to be a family friendly kind of a place. What's, what's your opinion? Well, on there that? are definitely parts that aren't family friendly, uh, but those are easy to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, Mardi Gras is actually a very family oriented event. Uh, there would be times that the extended family there, uh, we, camp out along the parade routes uh or i shouldn't say camp out but we, we stake out a spot on that and there might be times that we may have as many as 40 or 50 family and friends just gathered on that spot so you're all sitting and sharing food sharing drinks all that kids sit and watch parade we've taken several people down uh several kids have taken their friends down and have just been kind of in awe of all the stuff that you can manage to get from Mardi Gras parades, how many mm. of them there are, how elaborate they are. Um, but there's like, also there's just so much history. Uh, food in New Orleans is amazing. So you know, kids always look forward to having beignets every morning. And, mm. and uh, my son and I love it when it's crawfish season. So you just go into the grocery store, grab two pounds of crawfish in a bag and sit on the parade route and eat. Oh, wow. So, so do you, ever do Disney World or is Mar uh, Mardi Gras and New Orleans kind of your own Mardi Gras and New Orleans version. pretty it. Uh, my wife would love to go back to Disney World. She has very fond memories of going there in high school with the marching band. Uh, I went once in 1982 uh, right before they opened Epcot. Yeah. And so you've never I seen like Epcot? Nope. I, I enjoyed it, but uh, I remember we got up very early the next morning, drove to Tampa, and went to Bush Gardens, and I had much more fun at Bush Gardens. So. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you're a roller coaster guy, then. Yes, I like roller coasters. So, nice. Yeah. So, what, what uh, theme parks have you traveled to? Well, Dollywood is the the, the mainstay here. Okay. I have been going to Dollywood since well before it was Dollywood. I've been going probably since 1980. Okay just about every year, not not quite every year, but just about every year. There were many years we had season passes. Uh, we've had passes to both the, the theme park and the water park. Uh, so I've watched it grow and evolve over the years. Uh, and that's usually what I recommend. We've taken lots of people there. Um, as far as roller coasters now, they're, they've gotten much better with the roller coasters. Yeah. So they have some stellar roller coasters. You would coasters. think in the mountains, they could come up with something that was pretty incredible view wise and they have uh if that the well there's actually two rides at dollywood that stand out for views one is a uh, wild eagle mm -hmm. which is a coaster that that uh, is called a wing coaster so you actually kind of feel like you're flying uh, but when you get up to the very top of it it's one of the best views in the smokies the thing is it only lasts for about five seconds and uh -huh. then you drop uh, so you're not really paying attention but they recently uh added drop line which is a tower ride that goes i think 300 feet up in the air and then you circle around and the view from there is just uh, spectacular so yeah. so yeah they've they've they they work in their mountain surroundings pretty good so so how is gatlinburg doing now because i know they had the fires a couple of years ago and uh we went over shortly after the fires uh it was it was really kind of sad to see all the all the stuff that had happened but uh They've bounced back very well. I, I don't really know from tourism numbers what they are, but every time we've gone over there, they've still had very significant crowds, still get stuck in traffic. <laughs> uh, you know, most of the stores, most of the main business section was, was not harmed in any way. So yeah. it was some of the resorts and some of the hotels and stuff that were damaged. Uh, Pigeon Forge, which, of course, is nearby. And Sevierville, Sevierville just announced uh, they're building a water park uh which 
the name was kind of funny, is Soaky Mountain Water Park. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll oh, be built. No. Yeah, it'll be built next to the uh, wilderness uh, lodge and water park. Is, is there a uh, sound effect of wah, wah, yeah. wah, wah, <laughs> every time you come in? <laughs> oh, man. So when you're when you're doing these road trips, uh, how how old are your uh, kids? Uh, I have one that is 14 in freshman in high school, and a 19 year old who's a sophomore in college. Okay, did but you? They've been traveling since they were born. So when you were doing the road trips at that younger age, did you have like little road games and stuff that you would play with them to uh, pass the time? No, we had portable DVD players. <sighs> Or Game Boys for a oh, while. Oh, so, Lord. Uh, <laughs> I know every now and then we would probably play some games. But, but yeah. yeah, but by and large, they, they, they seem to just kind of go off in their own little world and watch movies and stuff like that. Did, so. you, did you travel a lot when you were growing up? Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you have uh, little games that you play? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't really remember too much. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I do remember us taking a trip out to Nebraska. Uh-huh. Uh, when I was five or six, I actually I may have been a little older than that, and I remember we were in a white Pinto station wagon with a lime green interior and no air conditioning. Nice. So, I've, I've been in that world of the, yeah. my first car was a Pinto station wagon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we called it the party mobile. Oh, so. It, uh, was, uh, it was yellow with a brown interior. Lovely. But there were lots of trips to, there were lots of trips to the beach. Uh, we did uh, Jekyll Island in Georgia several times. Did uh, Folly Beach and outside of Charleston several times. Uh, then we would also do, you know, trips, a lot of trips involved family or whatever. So we took several trips to West Virginia. Uh, my mom is really big into mountain music. So she would also take us to all kinds of, uh, fiddlers conventions and old time music festivals and different places. Uh, one of my favorites that we did was Carter Cave State Park, mm -hmm. which is, uh, between Lexington and Huntington. And, uh. While she'd go off and do the, the music stuff and everything, I'd just go explore the park, which is not only are there something like 50 caves on the property, not all of which are open to see, mm -hmm. um, but there's also five or six uh, natural bridges on the property, uh, which are just fabulous. So, What got you into establishing yourself as kind of a local travel or day trip type travel person? Well, um, my background is uh, was television news. I was a producer for about 15 years. Uh, after a second layoff, I started uh, doing work for the uh, Knoxville News Sentinel. I uh, actually started writing business stories, which was kind of odd because I'm not a business-minded mm -hmm. person. So they ended up biz being business features. Well, at that time, the, the News Sentinel was doing a series of... Uh, travel articles that were based four hours or less from Knoxville. So I thought, well, that's easy. We do lots of these these trips anyway. So mm -hmm. I was like, why not write and get paid for it? So I uh, started doing that. Um, so we, I, all of a sudden we found ourselves just going to all kinds of places that I just hadn't been to in a while or places that I wanted to introduce my children to. Uh, some of the first ones that I did was I, I we took them to uh, Roan Mountain, which is on the uh, Tennessee, North Carolina line, which has the world's largest rhododendron gardens. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did that. I took them to uh, Brakes Interstate Park, which is on the Virginia Kentucky line, which is nicknamed the Grand Canyon of the South. Wow. Uh, it's just an absolutely beautiful. I know part nothing of the world. about these places. Yeah, okay. I've lived uh, here my whole life. I know nothing about yeah, these places. Uh, I've, I'm on the wrong side of the state line, I guess. Yeah, and then, and then of course, <laughs> then we branched out a little bit. And I got to got to do some other things. At the same time, I was also writing for an online publication called Examiner.com, and was mainly doing day trips there. So it was like you know things that you could do easily from Knoxville and just go up and spend the day. And a lot a lot of times that was just based on my own experience or where I was already traveling. So uh, eventually, things changed with the uh, the uh, newspaper industry. Uh, so I no longer was writing there. So that's when I s switched and decided I needed to do my own blog. And that's how KnoxRoadTripper.com came to be. Nice. So you started as Day Tripper, though. I started as Day Tripper. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of that goes back to those days when I was doing Examiner.com. Yeah. Because that was, that was, I was the Knoxville Day Trips Examiner. And 
So that's how I stuck with that. But then the more I looked at it, we were going lots of places that we were actually staying overnight, staying multiple days. And then I also wanted to figure out ways to incorporate, you know, like our trips to New Orleans or our trips to the Midwest. Or, right. Um, and my son and I took, uh, we were actually on a mission trip to New Jersey for a week back in 2016. And so we did all kinds of different things along the way there. We went into New York City for the day. We did Philadelphia for a few hours. We went to Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. You, you sound like my yeah. kind of travel where yeah. I pop in and pop out. It's like, yeah. it's, I've been here. Yeah. I'm on to the next yeah. one. I, you, you, you can spend all of this time in the Tennessee and yeah. North Carolina and South Carolina area. And then you get to New York and you're there for 15 minutes. Yeah. Well, it was really kind of interesting. The, the, the day in New York or whatever, it, by the end of the day, my, my son and I were exhausted. Mm -hmm. uh, we went back to where we were staying in New Jersey. I asked him, I said, do you want to go back on Saturday before we leave? And he said, no. Yeah. I said, I, I've seen it. I've done it. I can say I've been there. And so then after we had done Philadelphia, we, we stayed the night somewhere in the area there. And I said, well, we can do D.C. or Baltimore on the way back through if you want to. He said, no, I'm done with cities. I don't want to do any more cities. So that's how we ended up at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, which yeah, was that's was, great, which was perfect. Yeah. So. Yeah. A lot of history there. It's a beautiful oh, it was, area. Yeah. Did you walk up to Jefferson's Rock? No. OK. Not that I know of. We weren't there for a long time. But I remember on another trip through there, I remember driving through Harper's Ferry and being on the other side of the river and seeing it and not being okay. able to get out and and, get and it. see it yeah yeah and that always stuck with me i don't like to do that it takes a little climbing to get yeah. up there and my kids get annoyed with that a lot too it's just like I, i'll see something along our trips and i'm like oh well, we got to get off and see this and all that and they're like no we don't <laughs> it's like we're never going to get there dad so. yeah it, 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 there is a lot of impatience in kids yeah they, they want to get off the road and to the destination well it was funny too it's like i would i would take my daughter on a couple of trips there was one summer i took her on several trips and she would there was one place in particular which was red boiling springs tennessee which is about an hour and a half or so north of nashville and it's an old resort community and she really didn't want to go mm -hmm. and she made that very clear almost all the way out there so she didn't really want to go and all that well by the time we were done there She's like, do we have to go? And when are we coming back? <laughs> you know, and she'll do that. She would do that a lot. So, you know, I think part of it is just her not quite knowing what a place is going to be like. Uh, and Will, Will's a little bit like that, too. But Yeah. I guess, too, we tend to get our heart set on what we're headed towards. And any deviation feels like, oh, yes, this is not what I was anticipating. What are we doing? Yeah. Let's, I, I brought up the great state of Franklin. Yes. I find that fascinating that um, we almost had a 14th state before yes. even Tennessee was considered to become a state. Um, I don't know all of the details. I know that, that uh, Greenville at one time was the, quote, capital of the state of Franklin, and they actually have a little recreated cabin downtown that they call the capital. Uh, and there's so much stuff in that area that's named State of Franklin or named Franklin. Um, I think my, basically what I understand is, you know, was, Tennessee was part of North Carolina, but yet was because of the mountains that divided, you know, the, the physical barrier there, the East Tennessee section was just f far removed from whatever was going on in North Carolina. Yeah. So they kind of felt the need to be their own state. Uh, and that's how it grew. Of course, it never became a state, but. Well, and uh, the, the part I had heard was that they named it Franklin because they wanted Benjamin Franklin to get behind it because they thought he would have some pull. And he sent back a letter saying, well, you know, I've been overseas and I really don't know what you guys are doing, <laughs> but I'll look into it and get back with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and apparently he didn't get back with them. Of course, in time. it didn't take too long until Tennessee became a state. So I mean, a state who was in 1796. So, yeah. So I didn't I didn't want to leave that state of Franklin thing no. hanging out there. So uh, it, it's, it's certainly just the, a, it's certainly a unique part of the state. Yeah, uh, it's certainly full of, uh, you know, full of history. Uh, because that, you know, as I say, it was also the home of Andrew Johnson, which of course had nothing to do with State of Franklin. But right. uh, uh, and even though he's probably not one of the most beloved presidents, I always felt it was 
always felt a connection from being there. Uh, I actually attended church when I was a child with his uh, great granddaughter. Oh wow! Uh, who is actually buried in the same cemetery plot at the National Cemetery in Greenville okay. as as President Johnson? So. Huh. I always was interested in him because he has my same first name. Andrew. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. So Andrew Jackson and Andrew Johnson always yeah. were of some kind of interest to yeah. me. Now, I do like the fact that both of the kids have, have kind of, uh, they, they may not say that they like history so much, but oftentimes when there'll be some kind of historical conversation, they know the answers yeah. usually. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, it's because we stopped there or we did this or, you know, it's like, or dad, you talked about this. And so, so that's kind of instilled in them. See, I, I think that's interesting, too, because I had a, a father that drove us all over the place, and it was always history yeah. wherever we went. And I think that love of history just goes from generation yeah. to generation. And road tripping, I think it's the same yeah. thing. I mean, do you see them having interest in doing it on their own, or is it a little too early to kind of gauge Probably a that? little too early. Uh as I say, my son is, who is uh, 19, he spent his entire summer in Ames, Iowa, working with his uncle. And um, I don't know that he really had the opportunity to go do things on his own much. Uh, he did have, I think, three trips to Vermilion, South Dakota, which apparently were, was not <laughs> a place that he really wanted to go. Uh, yeah. But uh, he, he did say, well, I did work in two more states because one of the days that we drove, we ended up going through Nebraska to get there. So he got uh, okay. to add Nebraska and South Dakota. So Nice. So Yeah. Get them while you can. Yeah. <laughs> I used to think I'd never get to Nebraska. So when I took a trip across the country, I made sure I took a side road and at least nipped the corner yep. of Nebraska. Of course, later I ended up going through Omaha because I was planning to go to North Dakota and then a tornado was coming through. So I decided <laughs> to go to Omaha instead. Yeah. But so speaking of uh, weird events while you're out driving along the highways and byways as a road tripper, I, I saw you got a toll ticket here yes. recently. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I was expecting that one. So, um, yes, I was going to uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I was actually at a conference for work in charlotte and so there is a section of us 74 where google told me it was going to be 30 minutes shorter if i took the toll road it was only going to cost four dollars i'm like sure because mm -hmm. i'm in a hurry okay so I, I took that and i got that but i did find out from our trip to uh missouri and iowa back in may we didn't realize that the bridges in louisville had become toll bridges uh so we came across the bridge. Well, I got on their website to find out that they don't invoice you until you've gone the other direction. They, In, they, they invoice you to go into Kentucky, but not into right. Indiana? Okay. Yeah. Well, if you, if you do a two-way trip, yeah. then you get a bill. But they won't bill you until there's two tolls really? on there. Really? So you could go that way and then come back another way. And, and that's you're exactly fine. what we did a few weeks ago. We got off, went to downtown, went across the old bridge, and went into Indiana. So I didn't. <laughs> so I avoided the toll bridge. <laughs> oh, those things you learn. It's uh, if you cross over into the. I always laugh about this, and my Pennsylvania friends will laugh at this too. When you drive across the Ben Franklin Bridge to go, or yes. the Walt Whitman Bridge to go to New Jersey, it's free. But you have to pay to get, to in, get back yeah. into Pennsylvania. In New York, it's the same thing. You have to pay to get into New York, but it's free to get into New Jersey, which makes me say, what does that say about New Jersey? <laughs> I thought about that once on a trip to there, because I think you, when you're going up 95 and you cross into Delaware, it's like you only go through that little tiny stretch of Delaware, and it's like you have to pay like 25 bucks to see Delaware. <laughs> you know, <it> was like, <laughs> yeah. Or something like it's, that. It's ridiculous, and, yeah. You know, uh, yeah we, my son and I had lots of toll stories that, that were to us were just frightening because I was just not expected to shell out as much money as we did for tolls. Well, and the shock is now that you'll drive through areas that are tolls, but there's no toll booths. So right, how and that's how the, the, the North Carolina road is, and that's how the bridges are in Louisville. Because there's, there's, we were, like, trying to figure out, well, how much is the toll going to be? Where are we going to pay it? And then realizing that now they just take a picture of your license plate and send you a bill. So, but apparently the Louisville people don't send you a bill until you've gone both ways. Okay. So. It doesn't make it very comfortable to drive, but then I, you can use GPS and say avoid tolls, but then you're going to go through every little town. Yeah. Well, and then, and then we got to one point where 
we apparently didn't have it was one of those where you had to have exact change because there's no uh, toll purse. So we were literally grabbing every single piece of change in the car we could and just throwing it <laughs> into the machine. Oh, man. Uh, uh, we learned our lesson after that. We stopped at one of the travel centers and got like two rolls of quarters or something. After yeah. That. So, so that it, wouldn't happen again. It'd just be nice if they all standardized so yeah. that you knew because sometimes I get this chill down my spine when I'm driving and I'm going, oh no, do I have money for tolls if yeah. they come up? Well, I think, well, at least it seemed like in the Northeast, they're all on the same easy pass system. So right. you can go and prepay, but if you don't know how much you're going to need, like if you're just visiting, it doesn't make much sense. I guess if you're up there and you drive it all the time, you know what to expect. Yeah. Well, and it's confusing for me too, because when I flew up to Minnesota and was renting a car, they try to tack on extra money for easy pay oh, yeah. uh, as part of your rental fee. And I was thinking, well, I'm going to Canada, but I, I don't know if they have easy pay anywhere along my route. And so right. Right. They, it, they can really almost get you to pay for something you don't need because right. I didn't need it. There were no tolls. Yeah. Yeah. They do have easy pass also up in Canada, so I understand. But um, there was no need for me to do it because I was driving in the middle of nowhere. And the, <laughs> They know they can't tax people to, yeah. you know, not go to the middle of nowhere. Otherwise, nobody will go to nowhere. <laughs> so tell me about, because you just recently went to Oak Ridge. Was that your first time going to Oak Ridge? Well, to, to, to do the Department of Energy tour, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Department of Energy tour is because so much of it is basically just a large military installation so there's very high security and all that so really the only ways to get in and kind of see some of the inner workings is to do this department of energy tour which it's a bus they have 35 people they only do like three or four tours a week mm -hmm. so we just happened to be at the american museum of science and energy and they announced they had four spots left on the bus and um so i asked my daughter and her two friends or whatever I said would that be okay if we do that and uh, they all said yes I think at points they were probably bored but they also thought it was kind of neat to, but it did take you in it did help me understand a little bit more about what each of the facilities there did during the Manhattan Project and what they do today yeah uh, which was the development of the atomic uh, bomb right yeah uh, and then uh, just to be able to see the graphite reactor which was if I'm not mistaken was the first nuclear reactor in the country and it was a research reactor I mean, it did produce energy but they were doing it for research purposes to figure out i guess i don't know it was way over my head as yeah. far as the science part but i had known about it but it's a national historic landmark and so you you get to go in there and you see where all the rods go and there's like there's all kinds of color coding and they kind of explain how you know different things were put in these different things so the kids actually kind of got into that trying to because there's a there's a chart on one side that says how many of this rod there was and how many of this so they were trying to count up to see if they could find six of those dots on there and yeah uh and it was just you know it was a cool old building it was just nice to kind of finally see that um, is it just recently opened up for people to be able to no, go in there? No, they've been or? doing the DOE tours for a long time. I just haven't had a chance to do it. Okay. And, um, you know, after 9-11, th lots of things changed as far as that. Uh, the only ways that you can do the tours, you have to be an American citizen. You have to be, I think, 10 years. You have to be at least 10 years old. Okay. Uh, you have to have proper ID. Uh, so, and you have to present all that stuff and there's like two or three different ways that they check things. So basically it's kind of my understanding that after you've signed that you're going on it, uh, before the bus actually arrives and everything, they're actually doing background checks on you. Oh, okay. Oh man. <laughs> now, I, no one got pulled off our bus. So, yeah, but you do go through some heavy security checkpoints. And in fact, that was one of the things that, that just absolutely threw my uh, daughter off is when we got to the Y-12 Visitor Center, which is the Y-12 uh, National Security Complex. And uh, we walked into the lobby, and there are there guys in their fatigues with machine guns, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a she, little intimidating. Yeah, and then she sees this sign that says, no cell phones, which is actually, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really no cell phones for you. It was really no 
you, if you were a government employee, you had to have a certain type of sticker uh, on your uh, cell phone okay. to allow you to use it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, they, they moved us over to the little auditorium area and the little history history part or whatever. And she saw some guy with his cell phone out, and she saw me. And I said, Dad, you're not supposed to have that out. <laughs> the so, guys with the machine guns are going to come <laughs> over here. <laughs> so, but then, but then a little bit later, we got to. Um, when we were going into the ORNL, Oak Ridge National Laboratory section or whatever, and going through the security guards there, you have to stop. The security guard has to come onto the bus, check all the papers that you've signed earlier and all that. And he has to kind of like give a visual look over to make sure that there's that many people and all that. <laughs> and um, the guy said, uh, our tour guide said, you know, just make sure that you're quiet and you don't say anything inappropriate or whatever, you know, when he comes on and all that. And so I'm like that. And so my daughter kind of looks at me and says, He's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you probably won't want to say that too loud. But anyway, so, yeah. so she and her friends thought that that was, that was great seeing the... Nice. Yeah. You didn't see any glowing people. No. no so this no. is funny because uh, we used to pass by Oak Ridge all the yeah. time when we go out to Texas on road trips. And um, I just always knew just a, enough about the history of it and then the whole nuclear reactor yeah. and all of that, that yeah. as a kid... You could have some fantastic visions yes. of what that yeah. place could have been all Even about. Even growing up here, I mean, we've we've made those those comments before too. So. <laughs> Especially when you don't know exactly what they do. Yeah. And I actually have a friend that's in the communications department at Y12, and 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 you know, kind of, she can tell me some things that they do, but obviously she can't say everything. So it's kind of like the East Coast version of Area 51 without the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> Although, yeah, of course, who knows? There could be aliens there, too. I don't know. Yeah. We won't want to start that rumor. That would be so. a good diversion. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's out looking at Area 51. They're all over here. So uh, somebody's coming to uh, this area. What's a must-see? What's something that um, you, you think is also something that you think is maybe underappreciated? Okay. Well, right here in Clinton... Uh, which is where I live. I've lived here for 22 years. Uh, we have a place that's called the Green McAdoo Cultural Center and Museum. Um, I think sometimes the name may throw people off because they don't know exactly what that means. Uh, some people may think it's an art museum. It's not. It's actually a museum in the old African-American school up on top of the hill near downtown Clinton that is the, the, where the first 12 African-American students to integrate a public high school in the South. It's the school that they attended elementary school. Oh. And uh, by law, because the schools were segregated, they actually had to ride a bus to high school to Austin East in Knoxville, which was about a 30-minute drive. Wow even though they went right by the high school that they would attend. Yeah. So in 1956, which was a year before Little Rock, mm -hmm. uh, they actually came in, uh, started attending school under court order. Uh, things were fine for a while. Uh, there was some, probably some jeering and, and, and stuff like that, but it, things really were very quiet. And then some outside agitators came in and things kind of took, not necessarily a violent turn, but a very mean turn. Uh, to the point where the National Guard was called in. Oh, wow. Uh, there's actually film of tanks coming across the bridge I can <laughs> see from my house, which just is bizarre. I, I think I would really freak out if I saw tanks coming across yeah. the bridge. Uh, and so things kind of got a little bit rocky. Then the outside agitators left, and then in 1958, there was a bombing at the high school. Mm. And so uh, even though... It happened overnight, so no one, luckily no one was injured, but it did leave the town without a high school. Mm. And so it happened to be that the time Oak Ridge was starting to switch over to civilian use. They had an empty school, so the, the uh, um, students at Clinton High School used that for their high school until they could rebuild here. And apparently it's my understanding, too, that it was kind of a uh, – there was people from all over the world that were sending money here to rebuild the school oh, because wow. of what happened. So this, this museum – tells that story and mm -hmm. it's, it's it's not a very big museum but it but it tells it in a really good thing and and i think now there are several members of the clinton 12 that are still alive in fact uh the surviving members were actually here just this week mm -hmm. uh, for a special ceremony that they did they did a big proclamation in their honor and uh, they did a symbolic walk uh, from the green mcadoo center down to what is now clinton middle school which was the high school yeah so so uh, what else in the area would you say is kind of underappreciated? 
Uh, the other the other thing that is kind of underappreciated is the uh, coal mining history in uh, the northern part of Anderson County, um, which is not a real developed tourism thing, but there is like a, a there is a history trail. Yeah, uh, it's the site of some what they called coal mining wars when prison labor was brought in to to run the mines, and so their violence broke out. There were two very large uh, coal mining explosions, which. One of the interesting things there is after the explosions is is how they buried a lot of the miners. They're they're buried in there's several cemeteries that have what they call a miners circle. Mm. So there's actually a big monument in the middle, and then the the uh, miners are built in this are buried in a circle around that monument, and then the names are usually listed on it. And yeah. so there's like three or four cemeteries that have those. And uh, what I like to do sometimes is when I'm taking people to the cemeteries i don't really tell them what they're about and have them go ahead and look around and then when you start seeing multiple tombstones with the same death day oh yeah yeah it just kind of sinks in okay this is more than just a cemetery yeah another thing i don't know that it's necessarily that it's underappreciated but i think a lot of people don't don't realize uh there are seven national parks in east tennessee Okay, so uh, got Great Smokies. Got Great Smokies, which of course I think most people Everybody know about. Everybody knows. Yeah, it is the the nation's most visited national park. Now, granted, there's a lot of places within the park that a lot of people don't know about. I always suggest that people seek that information out from rangers, from locals, that type of thing, if they're going to go over there and want to avoid the crowds. Yeah, um, we have um, Big South Fork, which is on the Kentucky Tennessee state line. It's about an okay. hour and a half from from Knoxville. Um, and it's a mix of lots of, of a beautiful river gorge and a lot of uh, there's coal mining history and some other history there. Uh, lots of trails, lots of natural formations. Uh, that has always been my go to park just because you, you can walk forever and not see anybody. <laughs> And they have a lot of easy trails too. Yeah. Especially if you're walking the trails that go along the river, they're they're actually pretty pretty easy to go. Um, there's Cumberland Gap National Historic Park, which is actually in Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky. Okay. Uh, my mom actually lived up there for several years, so, and even as a kid, we would stop there quite often. Uh, just some significant history there but a lot of natural beauty too that's a place i really want to drive through especially in the fall yes yeah and it's and there's lots of places that are easy to drive to and see all the fall colors there's lots of trails there there's some uh cool land formations there too uh and it's just a it's just a really nice park uh and then of course you have the andrew johnson national historic site up in greenville which uh is in like two or three different places within downtown Greenville. All, okay. all fascinating. Of course, you you have his uh, tailor shop, which is well preserved and is in a building around it. That's where the visitor center is. Then you have the home he lived in after he was president, and then the national cemetery where he's buried. Mm. And then they have uh, a couple of other things there. And then even on a, it's not part of the park, but there's also the Andrew Johnson Presidential Library at Tusculum College, which is nearby. Okay. Then there's, uh, of course, there's the Chattanooga Chickamauga Battlefield Park, which of course part of that's in Georgia, but mm -hmm. but a good portion of it's in Tennessee up on Lookout Mountain. And then there's Obed National Wild and Scenic River. Okay. Which is, uh, I've only been there once, but, uh, you know, beautiful river gorge, lots of landforms, just very remote area. Mm -hmm. It's not a very big park, but it's, it's, it's very well maintained and, and pretty easy. And if, it's also my understanding that at some point during the month, I don't remember which weekend, that they actually do free rock climbing. Oh, okay. For all skill levels, oh. or at least they used to. I don't know if they still do that, but yeah. but that that was a, a cool thing there. Okay. So let's see. You're, there's one that I'm wondering if it's too far out for you to mention. Uh, Land between the lakes. Yeah, that's a little far. Yeah, because yeah, that's, that's that's over yeah, Nashville. Yeah, yeah. but uh, that's where I saw my first buffalo. Yes. Or bison, I should say, yeah. to be correct. I went to I went to Land Between the Lakes when I was, lived in Nashville, but I did I I don't remember I, at that point. I don't necessarily think there were were bison up there. Bison up there at that point. So, yeah. 
I'm trying to think if that's how I can. I've seen many since then, but that's because if you go to North Dakota, you're going to see yeah, bison. Yeah. <laughs> but Lane Between the Lakes is a place that I would like to go to again. So, yeah. so hopefully I'll, I have made it to Clarksville several times, but it just didn't go much past Clarksville. So Very nice. So Lots to see. Yes. Lots to see. Well, I appreciate you being on the show today and taking some no time problem. out and um, getting a chance to learn a little bit about a place that's very close to where I grew up, but yeah. I just, for some reason, haven't done much over. Uh, this was drive-through country for me. Yep. Between and Asheville and Nashville. And that so that happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the main thing I remember is in Knoxville seeing the, uh, the Sun's World's Fair. Fair. Sun's Fair. Yep. Yeah. And of course, you're <laughs> at Petro's right now, which was... Uh, uh, I won't say invented for the World's Fair, but the first Petros was actually located on the World's Fair grounds. It was one of the most successful food venues at the fair mm -hmm. to the point where they ended up going to New Orleans in 1984 and selling there. And then they finally br branched out. The original Petros, of course, yours was in a cup. The original ones were in Frito-Lay bags yeah. that were cut along the side. And then they put the chili and cheese and all the, the toppings mm -hmm. on there and you ate it out of the bag nice so well i like it it's a good collection of uh things i like all yeah. in one spot <laughs> yep well clayton thanks so much for being on the show and uh, tell everybody what your uh how people can keep up with you okay. your your website and social okay. media the website is knoxroadtripper.com and then you can follow me on facebook instagram and twitter at knox road tripper all right so. very good well one of these days we're gonna have to do a bourbon tour because you're yes. uh <laughs> yeah. you, you need to add some of those in or when you come down to south carolina we can hit some of those revolutionary war sites i'd love to do that yeah fantastic okay well thanks for being on thank you well thanks everybody for tuning in for another great week of travel fuels life and if you want some more information on clayton and his website and social media channels go out to travelfuelslife.com slash podcasts and look for episode number 35 and you'll find the show notes page right there and as i get back from tbex later on actually i got more coming up i'm actually headed to south lake tahoe and to carson valley nevada i've never been there before so i am really looking forward to my trip there that'll be following right after montana so got lots of fun stuff to do and i'm going to be sharing all of that stuff out on facebook.com slash travel fuels life and you will also find me at instagram.com slash travel fuels life and if you are interested in being on the show especially you t-bexers and you've got something that can inject some of that fuel into our travelers then give me a shout out at twitter.com slash travel fuels life and until next time, have yourself a great week, safe travels, and thanks for listening to Travel Fuels Life.